Okay, I'm excited for two reasons today. Number one, we're gonna be talking about the first image of the black hole that we now have from the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy. We have special guest and our resident astronomer, Jonathan McDowell, but also I'm excited because, and I'm stepping even further back, I finally, finally got a mic. So good, good for me good for the channel. So many of you have been asking me for so long, what the heck lady, get a mic. And so I'm really excited about it. Uh, finally found one that pairs nicely with my camera. So we're gonna have good sound quality moving forward. And it's just really nice not to have to stand up here because some of you guys also say, get away from the camera, you're way too close lady. So two very exciting things, but let's get into the black holes. Five. When I started off working on black holes in the 1980s, um, they were fascinating, they were exotic, but they were this like, you know, this weird thing that, that was its own thing and didn't really affect the rest of astronomy. Mm -hmm. What we now understand is that these monsters in the middle of galaxies, these supermassive black holes, actually have a critical role in the history of the whole galaxy. So of course, when the news broke, I wanted to talk to Jonathan McDowell and so did all the other major news outlets. I was able to squeeze in a little time with him in between his big interviews, but luckily for us here on YouTube, we're not constrained by time. So he gives us a lot of context and background. Jonathan says that by studying black holes, we're studying our own history. They may not affect us today, yeah, but they definitely affected how we got here. Black holes once an exotic side thing, you know, ooh, this is a weird Einstein thing. Does it really exist or not? Now it's like, oh, for sure they exist and we wouldn't be here without them. And, and, and right. uh, you know, it's like a really important part of the whole story of the history of the galaxy. Right. right. And, and so they're mainstream now in a way that they weren't in the 1980s. And yeah, it looks blurry, but this EHT picture of the Sag A star is actually extremely sharp. This image was produced by an international team of astronomers led by scientists at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian, who produced the first direct image of a black hole three years ago. And now we have a much anticipated look of the black hole at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. And this black hole called Sagittarius A star, which is shortened to Sag A star, shows the telltale sign of a black hole. That's a bright ring of super hot glowing materials circling in a dark center so dense and bottomless that not even light can escape. And the way that the light bends around the dark center known as the event horizon shows the object's powerful gravity, which is four million times that of our sun. This was, you know, we had the M87 uh, black hole a couple of years ago with the same telescope, but really the Sag A star result was the one that the telescope was conceived to do. Mm -hmm. Right. This was the point was to get to this moment. And it's a moment that, you know, ever since I was a kid, people have been arguing about Sag A star and and, you know, is it really a black hole and what is it? What are its properties? And now we're there and we can actually see it. He says, of course, he's thrilled scientifically, but he's also thrilled for his friends. He's really close with a lot of the team members that have been working on this for years because it's been a tough, a tough road, uh, very hard data analysis and say, so, you know, most of the observations were done uh, sort of five years ago, some of them. Uh, and it's taken that long to kind of resolve all the issues with the data analysis and really convince yourself that no, you trust the answer and this is the answer. Just a, a huge moment. So they had the press conference yesterday morning uh, led by uh, Feryal Ozil, but until now, we didn't have the direct picture confirming that Sag A star was indeed a black hole. Today, the Event Horizon Telescope is delighted to share with you the first direct image of the gentle giant in the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. who is an old friend. Uh, she was a postdoc here at, at Harvard back in the day. And uh, there's a bunch of other EHT people here at 
the, the Center for Astrophysics that uh, have all been working away, I have beavers on, on this. And, you know, no, no leaks. It's interesting. Like, like no coffee, ta- coffee time gossip of what the results are. Just, nope, can't talk about that. Uh, so they'd be, which is, you know, astronomers are often not so great at keeping these results secret. And so they, they really were pretty serious about uh, uh, not leaking the information before the press conference. Wow. What, what have we learned? Or, you know, what? So, so here's the interesting thing about Sajay Star that is um, uh, a bit more than what we had with the M87 black hole. Uh, is that we'd already studied because such a star is closer, right? So, so the, the images don't look that different, right? For the two black holes, but um, the M87 one is, mu- is a thousand times further away and a thousand times bigger. Yes. Because this one's closer, we can study the stars near it. Hmm. And so for many years, a, a couple of groups, one in Germany led by Reinhard Genzel and one in the US led by uh, Andrea Goetz uh, have, uh, have been studying things like the motions of the stars near the center. And in fact, they got the Nobel prize for this uh, a year or so ago. And, and so what they showed was you can see the stars whiz around the thing in the middle <laughs> around their orbits and they you know they, they're feeling the gravity and they're traveling really really fast and they orbit around and and so by seeing how fast they go at a given distance you can measure the mass okay and so we had a good measurement of the mass of the thing in the middle what we used to call the monster in the middle when i was in grad school because we were like, we're trying not to prejudge what it was right we all thought it was a black hole even back in the 80s but, but, but to be sort of less biased, we called it the monster. And, uh, and so we measured that this thing in the central part of, uh, part of the galaxy was pretty close to 4 million times the mass of our sun. So that was a really good measurement is the point. And, but what we didn't know is how big this monster was, right? Because the, um, uh, the stars we were measuring were still a few light years away from the monster. And so we didn't know if it was a black hole, which would have a particular size, or whether it was, you know, like a really dense star cluster that had the, all of that mass squished into a fairly small area, but not as small as a black hole would be. Mm-hmm. And so what yesterday's result shows is, nope, the size of this thing <laughs> is exactly what you would expect for a 4 million solar mass black hole. And so that really is signed, sealed, and delivered this is a 4 million solar mass black hole behaving exactly as Einstein's theory of gravity says it should behave. That is just, it's, it's just a gelling together, right? Of, and it's not a surprise. I think we would have been astonished if that hadn't been the case yeah, because yeah. there's so much other evidence accumulating that this is what's going on. But it's a more direct measurement right we're actually seeing the this and and so so it just is a good feeling that that yes this actually really is what's going on uh and we were just you know playing games with equations that this is a real physical object in the real universe that is behaving the way that this insane uh theory of gravity that einstein came up with said it should behave the refrain of Einstein was right again yeah. <laughs> is, you know, uh, over the past 10 years, we've had a number of things that gravitational waves were another example of this, where predictions that were made a hundred years ago turn out to be, you know, that were really hard to actually see, right? That it took a hundred years for us to get to the point where we could actually test them, yeah. right? And now we test them. It's like, yep, exactly spot on. <laughs> it's exactly what's going on. And, and so just a testament to Albert Einstein's insight and to the hard work done by everyone in the hundred years since. Now that, yes, we've confirmed the existence of black holes, we're studying the story of our own galaxy. And therefore that we have, you know, confidence in our theory of gravity 
that is the same theory that we use to understand how gravity works here on Earth. I read some articles saying that it's more like stable than we maybe thought. There's the black hole itself, right? And that's quite actually quite simple in, in, in theory, and, and it's what we expect. There's the crap that's falling into the black hole. <laughs> Yes. Right. And that's where the complications come in. Right. Because you've got like wolfly gas, you've got stars being torn apart, you've got, you know, and so you have this mess that's going, that's swirling around the plug hole of the bath, right? And and getting going down the drain. So that's the bit that's harder to model, right? Is is the flow near the black hole of the stuff that's about to fall into the black hole. And that's what you're actually seeing when you see this ring right it is the thing that's glowing and making the light from the ring is the stuff swirling around the black hole that's about to fall down it. this black hole is a thousand times smaller than the one in m87 and that means everything happens a thousand times faster roughly speaking and so on the m87 black hole things change on time scales of many years mm -hmm. on those galactic center black holes such a star things it, it takes only a few minutes to orbit this enormous black hole. Wow. Right? The, the material that we're seeing in that ring is going round and round the black hole every few minutes. There is the potential for very fast weather in this cloud of stuff around the black hole. Uh, and that was one of the challenges of the data analysis and why it took so long to, as it is to make sure that th th there's a problem, right? Which is that it takes a certain, you have to set your, anyone who's, who's done photography knows, you know, how long an exposure you have to take depends on how bright the thing is, mm -hmm. right? And so to get a properly exposed image, you need to run your telescope for a certain amount of time. And you want the person you're taking a picture of to like stay still for that amount of time, right? So if I just take a snapshot of you right now, right? in like fourth of a second, that's no problem. But if I'm taking a 20 second exposure, because it's like low light or something, I'm gonna have to ask you to not move for that 20 seconds, because otherwise my picture is gonna be blurry as you move back and forth, right? And so we're at the limits of asking the black hole not to move too much while we're taking the picture. <laughs> and and so, so we have to sort of account for that. Right. in our in our analysis and so that gets there are ways around it but it's pretty tricky we were worried that the black hole would be too changeable and it turns out no it's actually relatively steady more or less it's it's changing we see changes and the next the sequel to yesterday's press conference right is going to be sajay star the movie where over a period of years we're going to build up a movie showing how the flow around the black hole changes. And that's going to give us, that won't just be a cool thing to look at, it will actually give us extra handles on what's going on there. We'll be able to measure uh, properties of the material falling in that will, again, test the theory of gravity in more detail. This is not the end. Uh, even just for this particular black hole, we've got a lot more to study. Remind us, because uh, you, I think you tweeted this saying like, yes, it looks blurry, but this is because it's like extremely magnified. Right, exactly. It's like, so, so what I tweeted was a picture of the Galactic Center taken by Hubble. Mm -hmm. And people keep asking me about Webb and Webb's like about the same sharpness as Hubble in terms of the sharp pictures it takes. So you see this very sharp picture taken by Hubble of a much bigger area. Mm -hmm. And if you zoom it in, right, you, you get it gets pixelated. There's a, the, you know, it get if you if you magnify anything enough, it gets blurry. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, if I zoomed in on the picture I'm seeing of you right now, and I zoomed in on one of your eyelashes, even your nice high definition camera, right, w wouldn't have perfect, you know, wouldn't have a sharp image of the end of your eyelash, yeah. right. And, and so if you zoom in a Hubble picture or web picture to its maximum extent, so you're seeing individual pixels, the EHT picture would be a thousand times smaller than one of those pixels. And so it's looking at a tiny, tiny, tiny area. 
And so what you're actually seeing is a super sharp picture because you're effectively saying, if you imagine if the, if the donut, right, of the black hole is, is sort of, uh, um, you know, an inch across or something on your screen, it's the central piece of a otherwise empty picture that fills your entire block, right? <laughs> right? And so if you imagine a picture the size of a, uh, you know, a, a, like quarter mile long, and then an inch uh, across piece of it that shows the black hole, that's a pretty sharp picture, yeah, right? Yeah. It's just that there's only one tiny part of it that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that's really what's going on is, is that it is actually the sharpest picture ever taken probably uh because it's it's the the diameter of the ring is 50 micro arc seconds so what does that mean that is um if you i mean probably you have an idea of, of what a degree is uh you know it's a one three hundred and sixtieth of a circle uh and then an arc second is, is 3,600 times smaller than a degree. And then this is 50 millionths of one of those. Oh my gosh. And so it's a tiny, it, it's, it's a, it, 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 we're, we're magnifying an incredible amount. And that's the whole point of this event horizon telescope, which is this fancy name for using all the radio telescopes in the world and using basically the size of the earth as the size of your telescope so that you have a big enough view to zoom in on this tiny, 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 tiny part of sky and see what's in there. And so it's another way of saying it is this is the biggest effing magnifying glass <laughs> that humanity has ever built. So we're seeing it as it was 27,000 years ago. The reason we can't take a visible light picture is because between here and there, there's all of this interstellar dust and soot that is blocking our view in visible light. And so we have to use radio waves to see through that mm -hmm. and see what's there in the middle. Is it a danger that it's in our galaxy? That may be an extremely dumb question, but... No, it's not dumb at all. Uh, how many, I mean... Every galaxy, so, so let, let's step back a bit and talk about black holes. Um, that there are two main kinds of black hole. There are the little ones. And by little, I mean, they have, um, they're collapsed stars. And a typical little black hole might be five or 10 times the mass of our sun. And there are scads of those throughout every galaxy. Mm -hmm. When you have a massive star, a few times the mass of our sun, when it dies, it goes bang, but the core collapses into a black hole. And so they just get made when stars die. And there's a bunch of them throughout our galaxy. But then there are these, the other kind is this supermassive black hole. Mm -hmm. And they're at least a million times the mass of the sun. And some of the ones I study are 10 billion times the mass of the sun. Just insanely massive things, right? And there's typically one of those per galaxy, bang in the middle of the galaxy. At the moment, the one in our the one in our galaxy is on the small end, right? It's four million times the mass of the sun, mm -hmm. so that's still super massive, right? But it's not like ten billion times, right? The, the, so my most recent paper was on a, a, a quasar PG fourteen zero seven plus two six five, where the the mass of the black hole in the middle of that quasar is 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 ten billion. So so such a star is wimpy as supermassive black holes go, <laughs> you know, which is which is sort of like feeble as heavyweight wrestlers go, kind of, yeah. <laughs> right? I, I mean, uh, and and um, and so you know, if it just sits there in the middle of our galaxy, it's really not a problem. Right. A misconception that people have about black holes is that they reach out and suck you in some special way, right? But that's not true anymore. I mean, it, it, that's only true to the extent that anything with mass reaches out and sucks you, right? So our sun, if our sun turned into a black hole, the orbit of the Earth wouldn't change. It wouldn't suck any more than it's currently sucking. What's special about black holes is when you get close to them, that's when things get weird and when there's no escape. 
Mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if you stay a respectful distance from the black hole, it's no different from if it were a star of the same mass. It's like a rattlesnake. Yeah, exactly. Treat it with respect, <laughs> right? And you'll be fine. Don't piss it off and you'll be fine. So where we are here on the Earth, in the, out in the boonies of, of the Milky Way galaxy, the contribution of the black hole's gravity to the gravity we're feeling from all the other stars in the galaxy is tiny, tiny, tiny. However, there is something that can happen with black holes, which is that if you feed them too much, they get angry. What do I mean by that? that? That if you have lots of dead stars and gas that dribbles downhill to the center of the galaxy and everywhere, the center of the galaxy is like downhill relative to everywhere in the rest of the galaxy, right? It's just how gravity works. And so if you have a lot of material that ends up near the black hole and it starts swallowing that material, you can't aim the material to go straight down the black hole uh, you're going to miss slightly. It's going to end up in this swirly thing around, which is what we're seeing uh, in the in the donut image. Uh, if you feed, if you make that donut too big, it gets uh, it starts shooting out jets along the north and south pole of, of the black hole, uh, uh, of uh, turning into just like radio, very powerful radiation, and the donut gets really, really, really bright uh, as well, and it just the scads of radiation come out. Uh, along the north and south pole. So there's both radiation and, 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 and particles zooming out in, in jets uh, uh, in two directions. And if that happens to be pointed at you, that would be very bad to be in the way of. Uh, and our galaxy doesn't seem to be doing that right now. It's sort of, you know, uh, it's digested its last meal. It's, it's not really very active, but uh, there are these other objects called quasars, which are just where this black hole is, is, is swallowing so much that the spillover is generating a, a thousand times more radiation from the black hole region than from the entire rest of the galaxy that it's sitting in. And so you'd see this incredibly bright thing in the sky, right? If, if our black hole was a quasar, uh, you, you'd see in Sagittarius a painfully bright point that was as bright probably as the brightest stars in the sky. And, but you'd also get radiation coming towards you that could potentially, um, well, could, could wreck the solar system if the, the, the particles are, are directly aligned to this. Uh, certainly you can get enough radiation to sterilize uh, the earth. So if the black hole went quasar, that would be bad and it could happen. Uh, but it's not that likely at this stage that most of the quasar activity in the universe died down a few billion years ago as, as the leftover construction materials from making the galaxies filtered down to the center of the galaxies and all got swallowed. Uh, I mean, certainly on the time scale of the next, you know, 100 million years or so, we're not expecting our black hole to get um, uh, to get too angry, to get uh, to get too active, uh, and even if it does, the measurements suggest. You know, one of the things that came out in the press conference yesterday was the black hole is face on, meaning it's pointing at us, right? Well, if you actually read the papers, what they really mean is, well, it's not edge on; it's not at ninety degrees to us. We can say that but it's somewhere between directly face on and 50 degrees from face on. And that matters a lot. If it's zero face on, then if it gets active, we might be in trouble. But if it's 50 degrees off, then we'll just see a spectacular thing in the sky and we won't see, we won't actually get hit by it. So, so, um, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that the, uh, uh, the Sag A star does not pose any kind of a threat to life on Earth. The evidence we have is that it's not pointed directly at us and, uh, uh, and it's not going to be super active anytime soon. Um, but there are galaxies where their central black holes have gone through this quasar phase where if you were sitting where we are, you'd be in real trouble. So, so not a stupid question at all. Is there anything else I forgot to ask or that you want to add? About I just want to rant about the name of the thing. Okay. J star. Uh, so, so the, the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is called Sagittarius A star. 
Mm-hmm. or Sajay star to its friends because we're too lazy to say all those syllables. And, and so Sagittarius is a constellation mm-hmm. of stars and those stars are all quite near to us, but it defines a direction in the sky. And it turns out that that particular direction, that particular zodiacal constellation, Sagittarius, is the direction that the center of our galaxy is in. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the stars of Sagittarius that you see with your naked eye are like a couple hundred light years away. Right. And so if you go in the same direction, but you go 26,000 light years, 27,000 light years, you get to the galactic center region and near the galactic center, radio astronomers in the 1950s saw a really bright source of radio waves. Actually, they saw uh, uh, at least two Uh, uh, and they saw, you know, bright radio wave sources in in uh, different parts of the sky. So another constellation is called Virgo. And in the center of the constellation Virgo, uh, that they called the brightest radio source they could see, Virgo A, right? A, right, right. And then Virgo B, C, D, and similarly. Uh, and it actually turns out that Virgo A is radio waves from the M87 black hole, we now know, uh, as our telescopes have gotten better, we've been able to see that. Um, and so we had again Sagittarius A, Sagittarius B were the brightest radio sources in Sagittarius. And as our telescopes got bigger, we could see Sagittarius A was this big woofly thing, big, big fuzzy thing that we now know is a dead star, a supernova remnant, a cloud of gas from a supernova remnant. But right toward the edge of, it turned out that when you looked at Sagittarius A with a better radio telescope, You see it was a big cloudy thing, but with a very bright spot sort of towards the edge of it. And that very bright spot was very sharp, almost star-like, right? And so we called it Sagittarius A star, which is the the strong source inside Sagittarius A. Mm -hmm. And so as our telescopes got better and better and better, we realized that Sagittarius A star was actually the interesting thing. Sagittarius A itself was boring. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Sag A star was the center of our galaxy. And it's the black hole that we just saw today. So, so it's important to distinguish between, <coughs> between Sag A, which is boring, and Sag A star, the point source, mm-hmm. which is the black hole. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, so you're basically just saying it's important to say Sag A star versus what I said at the beginning, Sag A. Yeah, right. Exactly. They're two different things. My apologies. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, and and you know, I mean, there's, you know, <coughs> a lot of the media make that error. I had the same problem with NBC yesterday. So <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, are, are a lot of people messing that up in the articles that you're reading? Yeah, it's, it, and I don't blame them. You know, it's, it's, it's an arcane piece of astronomy trivia. <laughs> Yes. But, uh, but, you know, it's, we like to get these things right. So, sure, sure. so that's why I go through the history here. So hopefully you enjoyed seeing my backyard. It's been such nice weather here in Salt Lake City. I couldn't resist, but I also just wanted to celebrate the fact that I don't have to stand so close to the camera anymore. And I finally have a microphone that is doing us justice. So I'm so sorry that it took so long for me to get my act together and get one of these. And of course, a big thank you to Jonathan McDowell, as always, for making time to educate us here on Ellie in Space. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to Ellie in Space. And it's crazy because next week is my last week in TV news. Yeah, I've been doing that for almost nine years now, and I'm deciding to make the transition to do Ellie in Space full time on YouTube. It has been such a joy to provide you content, and I know that with my skills as a journalist, I will be able to bring you much better content with a full time effort. So if you haven't already considered checking out my Patreon, please make sure to give it a look. Of course, any little support goes a long way. I really, really appreciate the support and I can't wait to show you all of the content that I have in the works that I plan to film in the near future. I'm planning another trip to Texas soon and I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm moving there, but more on that in a bit. If you've made it to this point in the video, congratulations, you 
Do not get a donut from Krispy Kreme. That was apparently an offer today on May 13th, ooh, Friday the 13th, was you could get a free donut at Krispy Kreme in honor of the celebration of the new image, you know, of Sag A Star, but they didn't do anything special to the donut. I did not get one, but according to the news article I read, it was just a plain donut. They could have been more festive, right? Maybe adding some edible glitter or something to signify a, gal a galaxy, I don't know. Anyway, if you've made it to this point in the video, I really, really appreciate you sticking around, helping me with that audience retention rate. That is something that I do need to booster on my channel. But thank you so much for watching this video. I can't wait to bring you more content and have a great weekend. <music>